From Capital Broadcasting and WREL Documentary, this is the WREL Doc Podcast. I'm Cliff Baumgartner. Part of it was a realization that I was allowing my political ideologies to dictate my science opinions. And I, you know, the more I thought about that, the more disgusted I got with myself. That's Greg Fischel, WRL TV's chief meteorologist. And he's talking about a subject everyone seems to be talking about recently, climate change. Now, I know you're probably thinking, wait, I thought this was a show about hurricanes and tornadoes. And it is. Throughout this season, we'll look back on some of the most devastating storms in North Carolina history. But before we do, I thought it was important to cover some recent developments in the science of wicked weather. A few weeks ago, the U.S. Global Change Research Program released their fourth national climate assessment. Yeah, that's the thing you've been hearing about all over the Internet. You can think of the assessment like a scientific status update on the world's climate. And the picture it painted wasn't great. But here's the thing. The report is 1,600 pages long. I don't know about you, but that's not exactly my idea of casual weekend reading. So you might wonder, as I did, what's the report all about? And even more importantly, what's it mean? How is our climate changing and how does that affect our weather? Will the storms and hurricanes we're talking about get worse? Thankfully, here at Capital Broadcasting, we just so happen to have super knowledgeable meteorologists around to answer these questions. Enter Greg Fischel. A few days ago, he and I sat down to talk about the climate assessment and what its findings may mean for the future of severe weather in North Carolina and around the globe. So for today's episode, I'm going to bring you that conversation in full. Hope you enjoy. I imagine that anyone listening to this is going to know who you are, but just in case, give us a quick introduction. Tell, tell, tell me about you. Well, uh, my name is Greg Fischel. Uh, I've had that name for 61 point some years. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's going anywhere. Um, born and raised in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Uh, went to uh, Penn State to study meteorology in the mid and late 70s. And after a couple of brief uh, uh, employment uh, escapades uh, elsewhere, I ended up here in June of 1981, here being WRAL, and have been here ever since. Do you have even uh, the slightest idea how many hurricanes you've covered in your career so far? I'd have to go back and and count, you know, obviously. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, you know, I think back to the 80s with uh, Gloria was one that went right over Hatteras. They actually sent up a weather balloon at Hatteras right when the eye came over it because it was so unusual to have an upper air balloon, you know, going up at a place where an eye of a hurricane just happened to go overhead. You yeah. Know? So that was sort of cool. And then, of course, in the mid and late 90s, it just seemed like we were ground zero in the world, you know, between uh, Fran and Floyd and Bonnie and uh, Bertha. Uh, It just seemed like it was one after another. And then we had a little bit of a break, you know, there for a while. And and then things have gotten a little bit on the active side again the last few years. Yeah. So obviously the big thing right now that a lot of people are talking about and that sort of spurred this conversation is the climate assessment. Right. It just came out uh, last week, I believe, right after Thanksgiving. And there's been a ton of reports about that and and all the different impacts that it could have economically and obviously to nature and everything else. But I wanted to talk to you specifically as a meteorologist. When you look at that report, when you hear about it, what are the what are just at the top level? What have been the takeaways for you for what that report says for our future in in weather? You know what's uh, what's unfortunate is that the biggest takeaway for me is uh, what has been done with that report and how uh, it has been, uh, you know, by some people crucified and, you know, labeled as, uh, you know, not accurate. Um, and we can talk about that uh, more later. But, uh, but the biggest takeaway is that there are multiple lines of evidence uh, from many different sources that we are having an influence on the climate, that extreme weather is getting worse and uh, that it has uh, ramifications across a large spectrum, uh, uh, potentially from uh, human health to uh, tourism to, uh, you know, uh, uh, people living in, uh, in uh, parts of the world that are not nearly as fortunate as we are. And when you start uh, seeing sea level go up and so forth, then <clears throat> a lot of those places become uninhabitable. Where do they go? Uh, disease, uh, there, there's all sorts of, uh, you know, the whole, the whole spectrum of human effect really comes into play. And um, 
I guess, you know, one of my favorite people of all times is Kerry Emanuel, who's a, a distinguished professor of meteorology up at MIT. And, uh, and when he hears people say, well, you know, this isn't a big deal. I mean, you guys are just blowing this up for political purposes and so forth. And he said, okay, so we're conducting a chemistry experiment on the only planet we have. Uh, he said, is there a chance we'll find out 20 or 30 years down the road that it wasn't quite as bad as we had feared it would be? He said, yeah. He said, how lucky do you feel? Yeah. And, and really, that's what this boils down to is risk assessment. And, uh, and, and we all do that every day. I mean, you and I assess the risk of being in an accident every morning on our way to work. Is it worth the risk to try to get to work? And we, every day, you know, decide that it is, you know? Yeah. But, but that's what this boils down to. And so the question is, if there's a way to minimize the risk without doing undue harm to people, why wouldn't you do it? Yeah. On a kind of a top level, one of the, I guess, biggest, um, I don't want to say mistakes, but questions I hear people have sometimes, you often hear climate and weather being conflated. Yeah. And obviously they're very well linked, but could you just give a kind of a primer on the difference between climate and weather? Absolutely. In fact, uh, just last week, and I was up here for that, so I can testify to how cold it was in New York on Thanksgiving Day, uh, that I heard people saying, well, record cold in New York, where's your global warming now? Um, A global average of temperature is just that, it's global. And within that, you have, you know, episodes of, uh, of hot weather, cold weather, wet weather, dry weather. But Basically, when you're talking about weather, you're talking about what's going on now at a specific location over a short period of time. Climate is what goes on over a large scale, like over an entire planet or an entire country, over a long period of time. So like when we talk about our our normal high and low temperatures, that's based on a 30-year average. You wouldn't want to base that on one crazy year, right? you know? Uh, You average it out over 30 years, which most people assume is the smallest amount of time you can use to define a a given climate. Um, And and then you, you know, get some idea as to what the range of possibilities is or are uh, over that, you know, in that area for that that period of time. So, and I want to make sure I don't misquote him, but uh, Marshall Shepard, who teaches down in Georgia, uh, said that... uh, the weather is your mood and the climate is your personality. Mm, that's uh, good. We all have moods that swing all over the place, uh, but our basic personality is something that is a little bit more stable over a long period of time. And that's what climate is as opposed to weather. When we talk about climate change, I think because it, because it's the, the thing people can grasp onto easily, we often hear major changes, right, of, oh, the sea level is going to rise and these things are happening and it sounds almost like apocalyptic change. What are some of the smaller changes that we're even seeing now in climate change? What does that look like on a day-to-day basis for people, like for people in North Carolina now? Yeah. Well, I mean, like down in in Florida, South Florida, I guess they have these things called the, I believe it's called the king tides, where even if there's no big storm uh, at the time of high tide, a lot of these places are getting flooded on a fairly Mm. regular basis. So, uh, you know, those types of things uh, are, are already going on. In North Carolina, uh, it's uh, one of those things where uh, I was just looking at this last night that the majority of the warmest years at RDU, which goes back to 1944, have occurred since the year 2000. Hmm. Um, And especially the minimum temperatures, that's what's really going up. And that's what the most primitive of climate models predicted back in the 80s that we would see the uh, low temperatures go up quicker than the high temperatures that, uh, uh, you know, some people say, well, that's great. They'll lengthen the growing season, you know, mm-hmm. but there are other uh, other negative things that go, you know, go along with that. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not I'm not sure that there's anything in North Carolina that's happened so far that would rise to the level of being labeled catastrophic. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's the the, the the trends are are pretty undeniable, and the fear is with you know if we do end up having more intense hurricanes and more frequent intense hurricanes, 
uh, the Outer Banks of North Carolina are about as vulnerable as any place in the world. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and it, you know, Oren Pilkey over at Duke said years ago, he said, you know, we can uh, postpone the victory, but nature's going to win. Mm. How does that, that's always an interesting thing when you hear it, as you hear about a warming climate affecting, for example, as you just said, bigger hurricanes. Mm -hmm. I don't know in a lot of people's heads that those seem to be related. Mm -hmm. What is the correlation there? How does that work? Well, I mean, basically hurricanes thrive on uh, on warm water, especially warmth and moisture, and, and, and they're heat engines is what they are. And so the more heat you provide uh, and the more moisture you provide, uh, and, and for every, um, uh, you know, a certain amount of temperature that you increase, the amount of water vapor that can exist in the atmosphere increases as well. And so more heat, more water vapor, more fuel for the storms— there have actually been some studies that suggest that the total number of hurricanes may actually decrease, hmm. but the strongest of those will be stronger and we'll see more of them. Hmm. What would cause the overall number to decrease? That's a, that's a really good question, and I, you know, it's one of those things where I'm not, uh, I'm not an expert in, uh, in tropical modeling, and, and sure. I think that's where a lot of this uh, you know, has come from. Uh, there are other factors that dictate how tropical cyclones behave, such as what we call vertical wind shear. Uh, if the winds increase rapidly with height as you go up through the atmosphere, mm. it's almost like you being in your living room with the chimney flew open and it's windy outside and it just sucks all the heat mm. right out of your living room or den into the air. And so a hurricane or a tropical system is trying to congregate heat and these strong winds aloft are literally sucking the heat right away, and it never gets a chance to develop. So, oh, wow. Um, and, and that's why the vast majority of waves that come off Africa never turn into significant hurricanes. Uh, it, it's really a pretty rare thing, but the problem is, <laughs> you know, when it does occur, yeah. it, uh, there's a lot of land masses in the way that, that get adversely affected by it. Have hurricanes in, the, in recent his, history been increasing? Is it been about the same? Is there any change there? Globally, uh, there is or has been an increase in, in the number of hurricanes and also specifically the number of uh, really, really strong ones. It seems like every couple of years we're setting a new record for mm. the lowest pressure ever observed or the strongest sustained wind ever observed. Uh, but Again, there are many basins all around the world, like, you know, the Atlantic Basin, the Pacific Basin, the Indian Ocean Basin. And you can't look at trends in any one basin and equate that with a global trend. Uh, we've had quiet periods in the United States, you know, where uh, we don't have that many hurricanes that form in the Atlantic. And, uh, and, and again, you have to look at that. There is a cyclical nature to climate, you know, mm -hmm. and, which is well documented. And there are periods of time where it's really active. There are periods of time when it's not. But you really have to look at the big picture, you know, the entire globe, you know, what's going on there. You know, some of the warmest water in the world is in the Western Pacific. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it's pretty easy for, for a strong hurricane to spin up, you know, over there and affect, you know, Japan and Taiwan and, and, and all of those areas, you know, Asia. Um, and so, you have to look at that whole thing, you know, not not just our backyard, you know, but right. the whole globe. What is the obviously the big topic, especially coming out of this climate assessment, has to do with our impact on climate change. I think something that's e that can easily get lost in the shuffle is that climate change is a natural thing, and there is it doesn't seem like there's necessarily a negative value to it on its own. Mm -hmm. It just is. What is the concern now as we start to look into man-made climate change? How is that changing the picture as we look at, I mean, even all the way back in the history of our climate throughout, you know, the world's history? Right. I think the thing that's most interesting to me is that when you look back through these temperature records that have been reconstructed from ice cores and, and various means, that you see these fluctuations, but you do not see the rate of increase of temperature that we've seen in the last 150 years mm. anywhere in that record over, over that period of time. Uh, it is true that there have been very warm periods, uh, like in Greenland, where it's been warm enough to make wine and that kind of stuff, and that's, that's all very true. I mean, was, I'm not disputing that. 
Uh, but it's the rate at which the warming has occurred in the last 150 years. And, uh, you know, you hear the argument made a lot about, well, carbon dioxide is a trace gas. You know, it's less than 1% of the atmosphere. So, you know, how could, why, why are we worried about doubling that? Mm-hmm. Well, if that little amount of carbon dioxide and methane were not present, you and I wouldn't be doing this interview right now. <laughs> Uh, it's the, it's what protects us from, uh, from our temperature range being in a, in a, in an area where human life would not be sustainable. Mm. You know, the earth would be 60 degrees colder. The average temperature of the earth would be 60 degrees Fahrenheit colder without those greenhouse gases. Wow. So they're a good thing in their natural, you know, level of existence. Uh, what we're worried about is are we upsetting that very, very delicate balance, you know, and, and if that small amount of a gas is the difference between life and no life and we double it, doesn't it make sense that there's at least potential for that to have a huge impact? Because we're making it harder on ourselves. Now. Right. Right. Ex- exactly. Because the, the, the planet's probably going to keep on ticking the way that it does. We're, we're talking about human life here, yes. correct? Yes. That's yeah. that's exactly right. I mean, I have no doubt that the Earth will be here for you know a long, long time. And and I think this this is another issue is that you know we tend to focus, and I'm as guilty of this as anybody, on threats that are more immediate. Mm. And the biggest problems with climate change may be for our kids. You know, and I know that people say, oh, there you go with that old cliche, you know, about. <laughs> You know, it's for the children and all this sort of stuff. But in this case, it really is, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, and and I really don't want my kids, uh, after I'm long gone, looking back and saying, they they knew about this. Yeah. They knew about this and they chose not to take any, uh, any proactive measures to try to at least limit it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll probably, I guess I'll never know whether or not they make those comments or not. But if I was privy to them, I, I would prefer that they not <laughs> not say that. <laughs> I'm a huge comic book nerd. And so I always compare it to like living on Krypton in the last few days when all the scientists are going, hey, this is going to explode. And everybody else is going, nah, we're fine. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's like we've made movies about that for 70 years and we still haven't learned. That maybe we should listen and start doing something when they say that. Right. All it, of our sci-fi is about that, but we're still not paying attention. Exactly. So you mentioned earlier uh, at the beginning of this conversation about how things had been misreported or misconstrued from this report. And when you're talking about this, I, it's always so strange because when, especially when I hear scientists talking about climate change, it doesn't sound disagreeable to say, hey, we're trying to do something because we think there's a good chance that we're going to pay for it if we don't. That right. sounds like, like you said, that sounds like human nature. That sounds like what we all do every single day. Why do you think there does seem to be this pushback politically and socially and otherwise? I, my own personal opinion, and and the thing about it is, I went through uh, a huge change myself about you know six mm. or seven years ago. Uh, I had been a climate change skeptic to the nth degree for thirty years, mm. and uh, I I woke up one morning, which I kid in of itself was a good thing, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there was a question in my mind about was I doing the same thing the people I was criticizing were doing in that I was only looking for information to support what I already thought. Mm -hmm. And the fancy term for this is confirmation bias. And, you know, the the scientific method, you know, and we all learn about this and we're going through school, is that it's okay to have a hypothesis about anything, but you're supposed to test it. And the best way to test it is to try to prove it wrong. And only upon failing to do that do you accept it as your conclusion. And I think what's going on in the country right now, and I fault both sides of the political spectrum for this, I don't have a dog in the fight, uh, is that we have created these echo chambers uh, through social media and, and a lot of things like that where everybody has a place to run now to hear what they want to hear and see what they want to see. And they don't have to consider the possibility that they're wrong because they have a support group a mile long Mm. that's going to, you know, again, just reinforce what they already think. Um, And so, you know, I think climate change is only one victim of that. There are a lot of, you know, issues that have fallen prey to this uh, 
this, you know, segmentation, if you will, of, mm -hmm. of our society. Um, and it's just generally assumed that anybody that accepts the science of, uh, of global warming is a, a liberal Democrat that wants the country to become a socialist state. And the people that don't accept the science are, you know, extremely conservative, radical Republicans. And, you know, I just think that's unfair. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, you know, it's one of those things where why can't we, why are there only two solutions to every problem, A and B? And, and the ones that go for B will never go for A, and the ones right. that go for A never go for B. Maybe there's a C, a D, or an E. And let's sit down and have a civil discussion and say, hey, maybe there's a way that we can appease both concerns here, you know, to protect the environment, protect, you know, human life, uh, but not kill the economy. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, you know, North Carolina is one of the leaders right now in, in solar energy. And uh, so, I mean, I actually think we have a lot to be proud of, you know, that we're, we're uh, you know, moving in a direction where we're not going to be as dependent on fossil fuels as we were, but it's only one state. Mm. And it's only one country. And if, if China, I mean, it is, I agree with this. If China and India don't cooperate on this, it's, it's meaningless. Yeah. The challenge there too, right, is that you have to, you also have to agree that there is a problem before you can come up with those solutions. Yes. And it sometimes seems like that's a place this particular argument gets stalled too. Yes. No, you're, you're exactly right. Uh, the one thing I will say is that, you know, you, you see all these pictures of China with people having gas masks on because the air quality is so bad, and that's all true. But they are leaving us in the dust in terms of alternative energy development over there. Now, is it because they care about their citizens? I'm not going to make a moral judgment. Maybe mm -hmm. they do, maybe they don't. But I think they see dollar signs, mm -hmm. and they're sitting there thinking, okay, United States, you keep fighting. We'll hold your coat. And in 20 or 30 years, if not sooner, we will be the world leader in renewable energy. And you'll all be over there gnashing your teeth saying, darn, we had a great opportunity here economically. Yeah. And we blew it. It's really interesting that you say there was a, a time where, where you were also a climate change skeptic. Because like you said, in those echo chambers, you often hear of it's politicians who are the ones questioning it or it's fringe groups or whatever. But, I mean, you're a meteorologist. You do this for, for your career. What was it back then that made you have doubt? And was there, obviously you said you had to confront your own bias, but was there something, a piece of data, something you saw that started to change your mind? A, a little bit. P part of it was a realization that I was allowing my political ideologies to dictate my science opinions. And I you know, the mm -hmm. more I thought about that, the more disgusted I got with myself. You know, that those two things should have nothing to do with each other. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but I had a, a colleague uh, that I met back in the early 80s who uh, is a very well-known climatologist. And uh, he found it very interesting that the satellite data, which didn't even start until December of 1978, actually was showing cooling. And so I'm sitting there going, well, that's interesting because the estimates that we're making about the warming, you know, at the surface are based on stations that are, you know, they might be like in a city and they've got, you know, effects of urbanization mm -hmm. that are uh, throwing those numbers off. We don't have nearly as much data over the ocean as we do over the land. And so here's a satellite that's looking at the whole atmosphere 24-7. And it's showing cooling. And so that's a red flag, you know. Well, then they found out that there was a problem with the calculations, that there was what was called an orbital degradation, where the satellite was changing uh, its altitude above the Earth every year. Hmm. And that was throwing off the calculations. Oh, wow. And so when they accounted for that, then suddenly even the satellite was showing warming. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Now, the gentleman that, that – uh, and, and I download their, their data every month. I just updated it this morning. And even their data shows warming. Their stance is that the human impact is – or the human contribution to that is minimal – 
and that it, it's a very small signal and it's not a big deal. Mm. Um, but even their data shows a rate of warming of uh, 0.13 degrees C per decade. So that would be, um, you know, over a period of a century, you'd be looking at, uh, you know, 1.3 degrees C, which would be over two degrees Fahrenheit. Wow. And that doesn't sound like much, you know, like when our temperature changes by two degrees from one day to the next, nobody notices. Yeah. But when you look at a global average and, uh, and, and consider the ramifications of that, it's pretty huge. And the Arctic is warming up like a shot. I mean, it, that's where most of the warming is occurring. And there's concern that not only is that going to upset the apple cart with regard to weather patterns across North America, just because, you know, temperature differences from the uh, polar regions to the uh, tropical regions play a big role in the jet stream and where weather systems move. And so if you alter that balance, you know, what might that mean, hmm. you know? Um, and then there's also concern that if we lose the ice cap altogether, all the Arctic ice, that there's a lot of methane that's going to be released. And methane is actually a more powerful greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So it could accelerate the warming. I mean, the, the the fear is that we're getting close to this point where if we don't do something that we're not going to be able to anymore, mm. you know, it's just going to be a runaway, runaway climate. And that's sort of scary. Yeah. You know, if you think about it. Well, and that feels so big too. what if someone's just like, let's say someone's just sitting at home listening to this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know that necessarily when you when you hear that and you say, unless we do something, I think people are going to feel very powerless yeah. to that. What are realistic or just, you know, brass tacks, day-to-day life kind of things that can have an impact on this? Because it sounds so much bigger than any of us. No, that's a great point. Um, And, of course, you know, you can, uh, you know, people talk about reducing your carbon footprint, like, you know, don't don't, uh, fly as much, Mm -hmm. you know. Uh, Of course, now all the airline executives are sitting there going, stupid fish, he's (laughs) he's trying to kill us, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I've been, I'm on my fourth Prius right now. And to be honest with you, I didn't buy my first one to make a political statement. It's just a geeky car (laughs) and it sort of fit my personality. (laughs) Uh, And it is sort of fun to get 50 miles to a gallon. You know, it really is. Uh, now the, the electric cars, you know, some of them have a really small range and, it's just not practical yet. You know, if, if you get a wild idea on a Friday, you want to, you know, take a road trip for the weekend. Uh, you know, yes, there are some places, if you plan correctly, that there are charging stations and and uh, and you, you can get by that way. But, you know, we still have, have some work to do in terms of making this a, a seamless way to travel, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, but you got to start somewhere. Yeah. What about education? What are ways are the resources you'd recommend or things where people can get their own become better educated about this kind of stuff? There's actually a pretty interesting website called skepticalscience.com and you might think that it's run by skeptics. It's actually run by people that accept the science of climate change, but they have assembled all of the that they can find all of the skeptical arguments. Hmm. And answer or attempt to answer each one of those arguments and you can get as complicated as you want. I mean, you can get a basic explanation or if you want to go to peer reviewed literature with equations in it, you can do that too, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, it's, it's very well put together, very well done. Um, so that's, that's one thing I, I would recommend. Um, and you know, even, even if you just go to, um, you know, to NOAA.gov and do a search for climate, you know, there's probably going to be a link there to this assessment report. And mm-hmm. you don't have to read the whole 1,500-page thing. You know, it's like, you know, you there's like an executive summary that gives you an overview as to what the findings were. And so, again, you can delve in as little or as, or as much as you want. Um, what about for challenging themselves as you had to do? What I mean, I think that's such an interesting position that you that you come from. Is, is there, uh, that's very personal, but is there a way that you would encourage people to look at their own bias? Because I think the hardest thing about bias, right, is seeing it. <laughs> yeah. How do you know you're biased when you're biased? Right. And, and the thing about it is I, I have said 
in groups before. I said I was willing to be wrong once. I have to be willing to be wrong a second, third, and fourth time because if I'm not, I've fallen into the same trap I was in to start with. It's just that now I play for a different team. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't think you can ever become so comfortable and so sure that you have seen the light that you ignore anything to the contrary. Uh, in fact, to be honest with you, I mean, I have a very good friend uh, that I went to school with up at Penn State who's, uh, I think it's fair to say he's a big time skeptic and he has a science background, but I think it's good that he ask the questions that he asks because it keeps everybody honest. Mm. And if he brings up a point, uh, I don't think it's a good idea to simply dismiss it and say, well, you know, he doesn't have a PhD in this, you know, uh, we're, we're just not even going to talk about it. Uh, you know, why not say, okay, what, what is he saying here? You know, is there anything in the peer review literature that's already addressed this? Mm. If there isn't, Let's try to get some funding and look at it. Maybe there's yeah. something to it, you know. Um, if you think back to Galileo, uh, you know, that he comes along and says, no, the earth is not the center of the solar system, it's the sun. And look at what the church did to him. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, house arrest the rest of his life, ostracized, excommunicated, the whole bit. Turns out he was right. Yeah. So even the people with best of intentions uh, can, I think, sometimes get so locked into their way of thinking that they, they might, you know, to bring religion into this for a second, they might miss a message from the very God they say they worship. Mm. You know, God may have sent Galileo to the earth to teach us something, and we almost missed the message because we were so loyal to our, our self-created dogma. Right. And uh, that, that, that's another thing where I, I, you know, a lot of people will say, well, you know, you have to pick between religion and science. You can't be a religious person and a scientist at the same time. Yes, you can. Mm. You know, I think personally, I think they're very compatible. Well, science comes from the brain that religion explains how it was created. Right? Yes. So wouldn't it all be from the same <laughs> place? <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's a great point. That's a great point. And. Um, you know, from my own personal, you know, point of view, I don't think, uh, God has any objection to us getting smart, you know, <laughs> using the brain he gave us, you know? Right. Um, and, uh, like I said, I mean, there, there may be, maybe messages coming along all the time that, uh, that we end up missing because we get so, so loyal to a cause or so loyal to a group. Um, and, uh. That, and, and again, I have to be on guard, you know, because I did go down that road for so long. Uh, I think I'm acutely aware now of how easy it is to do that. Mm. Um, and hopefully that will keep me honest, you know, from this point forward. And that it wouldn't be embarrassing to, at some point before, between now and the day I die, if something came out that was really compelling uh, against my, uh, you know, current way of thinking that I wouldn't be uh, ashamed to say, hey, maybe I was wrong twice. Mm. You know, I don't think that's going to be the case right now, but yeah. um, you just never know. So with all that in mind, as we're kind of wrapping up here, sure. you know, this season we've been talking, we're talking on the show about wicked weather, about all the different types. And we're looking at hurricanes and tornadoes and all this stuff. And the one question that I kept seeing come up in every single story was what's next. Yeah. And it seems like we're at an interesting point now with the climate assessment, but also with many other things that affect weather and especially severe weather and extreme storms. When you look to the future right now, obviously North Carolina just had Hurricane Florence, incredibly devastating storm, uh, thought originally to be much worse than it thankfully turned out mm -hmm. to, to manifest. Right. What do you see going forward in... For, for weather and for, for things now? Where do you think we sit? Do you think it's a matter of time until the next gigantic storm or tornado, tornado or something hits? How do you think we can prepare those sorts of things? Boy, I just know that there are a lot of, of cycles that are natural, that are independent of anything that human beings are doing uh, that, you know, could result in another 
long period of, of relatively quiet hurricane activity, um, and that, that that would have happened with or without our, our influence. Um, again, I think the, 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 the thing we have to do is think, you know, this is an old cliche, but think not locally but globally and, uh, and take a look each year, like how many more instances are we seeing of flooding or, uh, you know, increases in disease? There, there's even uh, an interesting paper I saw a couple of years ago about there's an optimal temperature for mosquitoes hmm. and that that optimal range is shifting north across the United States. So, uh, you know, now we have many, many more mosquitoes in the central and northern U.S. than we used to, and they can be disease carrying, you know. Um, so, you know, the, the manifestations of this can be, you know, way beyond what any, any of us, you know, can imagine. Um, and so I think it would be stupid for me to say, yeah, we're going to have another, you know, another Florence within 10 years, or this is going to become the norm. Um, obviously there were some things really well forecast about Florence. And then there were some things that weren't, as you bring up, the intensity forecast was terrible. Mm. It wasn't a cat four, it wasn't even close at landfall. Uh, we've still got stuff to learn about, um, about the atmosphere in general. We've learned a lot, you know, but we still got a ways to go. Um, so, you know, at, at this point, I think it's about, you know, mitigation, about reducing the risk, uh, about looking at the entire planet as opposed to our own backyard. Uh, and then, you know, taking a look at, at what the data shows us. I mean, let, let the data speak. Mm. Um, don't try to contrive it, you know, just you know, let it tell its message. And the only fear I have is that if we wait until the evidence is so overwhelming that we're in big trouble, then is it too late to do anything about it? So why not be a little proactive and, you know, instead of just allowing the atmosphere to warm up to whatever level it's headed toward, uh, to try to cut that in half. And, uh, and then maybe we'll look back and say, wow, we dodged a bullet on that. The WREL Doc Podcast is a production of WREL Documentary, part of the Capital Broadcasting Podcast Network. We're produced by Shelley Leslie and yours truly, Cliff Bumgardner. Our music is by Lee Rosevere and Breakmaster Cylinder. If you enjoy the show, consider dropping us a review and sharing with your friends. You can find all of our documentaries at WRELDocumentary.com and subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or your favorite app. Until next time, thanks for listening.